Today I want to talk to you about a mystery four billion years old that is being investigated by a community of pioneers from around the world. Together, we are using advanced computer systems to investigate complex and ancient alien technology. And it turns out that this alien technology is inside every living thing in the planet. Its secrets may even give us insights into the deepest of human emotions, love. From early on as children, we come to feel like we understand the difference between things that are alive and things that are just machines. However, as science continues to reveal how life works, we find again and again that the magic that seems to distinguish between things that are alive and things that are not are actually created by complex, interacting, molecular machines. These microscopic machines are as precise and intricate as a mechanical watch, but instead of being run on gears and springs, are powered by the fundamental rules of physics and chemistry. Our understanding of the precise coiling and uncoiling of the DNA molecule, or the way that one molecule can literally walk almost robotically along the tightrope of another molecule, continue to show us again and again this molecular clockwork is real and pervasive. Now, what's most unsettling to me about this is that we didn't build these machines. As someone originally trained as an engineer, I gotta be honest with you, I kinda hate this. I mean, as the most clever species on the planet, we kinda like to think of ourselves as the builders of the most sophisticated technology in the entire universe, right? I mean, <laughs> we invented written language and, and the printing press. Uh, you know, we cured polio and sent a man to the moon. I mean, heck, we even took savage beasts and turned them into kittens and then built a global communications network to share pictures of them. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty impressive. And yet, when I look through a microscope, at a humble bacterium, who, by the way, his ancestors were on the planet a billion years ago, billions of years ago, I still wonder how it really works. <laughs> because the mechanical watch that is life is not like any watch we've ever built. It is biological gears and springs, but they fill you know, rooms and buildings and cities of a vast microscopic landscape that's bustling with activity. I mean, on the one hand, it's extremely well organized. But on the other hand, the sheer scale of all of this unfamiliar, well-organized stuff that happens in there makes me feel like, you know, I've stumbled onto an alternate landscape of technology that's built by an engineer a million times smarter than me. I mean, the more that I search for principles beyond the ones we've already learned, the more I'm overwhelmed with the feeling that this stuff was built by aliens. Okay, not literally. I don't literally mean that I think little green men and women came down from the earth and seeded life here like a billion years ago. Okay, what we understand, of course, is that life evolved on the planet over billions of years, right? But the results of evolution confuse even our smartest engineers when we try to understand how we could build what biology has evolved. What if life has good engineering principles and we just haven't figured them out yet? I mean, could studying biology give us the ability to extract new engineering principles that maybe then we could use to solve the world's intractable problems? Our experiments only give us glimpses into what happens in these tiny spaces, but what happens there has huge implications for the future in the 21st century and beyond. For example, our species has learned over time to share information from generation to generation. Early societies invented the oral history, later systems of writing, later the printing press, you got your radio, you got your television, and in today's society, we have the digital uh, ability to send information in all kinds of exciting ways. Now, in the early days of human communication, as anyone who's ever played the game of telephone knows, 
information could get lost. Books could get burned, histories rewritten, even forgotten. Now, in the 1950s, we found out how biology had solved the same problem of transmitting information from generation to generation. That's what the DNA molecule does. So, and we'd struggled with that for hundreds of thousands of years. So how good is DNA at doing that? Well, current estimates are that the error rate of copying is one mutation for every 10 billion base pairs that are replicated. Let me put that in perspective for you. In the entire history of the world, we think that there's been about 100 billion people that ever walked on the planet. So if we had been as good at transmitting information over the course of history that DNA is, that means that only 10 people in all of history would have ever miscommunicated. And we would be living in a very different world than the one we live in today. That's alien technology. And there's so much we have yet to learn about it. So I've told you that inside of us, there are these tiny machines that are made out of molecules that make us up. But can we really be machines? I mean, we don't really think of ourselves that way. I mean, we don't go to the mirror in the morning and see the same kind of futuristic androids looking out at us that we see in the movies. And yet, at the micro level, biology keeps telling us that, that the same events that make up that bacterium, you know, fancy words you learned about in biology, like metabolism and you know, protein translation and DNA replication, right? All those same things are happening inside our cells. So if we're to accept that we are machines, well, what kind of machines are we? And if we better understood how those machines work, could we better fix ourselves when we break, or as we call it, get sick? Could we do a better job of understanding how to harness the energy of our planet more efficiently and cleanly? Could we even understand love? After being trained as an engineer, I went on to graduate school to study neuroscience. And about at the same time, the father of my best friend passed away, and I considered these questions in the context of that event. They say that those who we love, who pass away, live on inside of us. For a neuroscientist, this is not just an abstract, romantic idea, but a matter of physical reality. Each time you come in contact with a new person, see a newborn child for the first time, or fall in love without fetching somebody, we know that the cells of your brain are forever changed by forming new connections and activity patterns that come to represent that person. Inside your brain cells, tiny, precise, molecular machines operating on the same laws of physics and chemistry as in that bacterium reorganize themselves in specific patterns to support those connections that are at the root of that emotion. Like an impression in soft wax, your loved ones leave a physical mark on your lives that are literally etched into the structure of your brain cells. When you remember them later on, a similar pattern of activity that occurred when you were with them lights up again, and this continues on as long as you remember them. Your loved ones and the emotions that you felt when they touched your life literally do live on inside you. That's because the love that you have for them happens in your body and in your brain. Wouldn't you like to know how that love happens and how those marks are left? I mean, I would. How love happens and how it works to many of us seems miraculous, and it seems like it's outside of the realm of the knowable. But in fact, it is a series of complex but specific and knowable events that happen inside your body only a fraction of which we understand today. Let me say this in a different way. Today we understand biology much like we understand chess. You learn how to play chess by learning the rules of how the individual pieces move and what they can do. Similarly, in biology, we've learned that there are lots of pieces, millions of pieces, but they also have rules for how they work and what they do. On a regular basis, these molecular machines make moves based on these rules that you could call an event. A series of all these molecular events happening in precise concert on a vast microscopic chessboard gives rise to the activity of a living cell, and consequently of every living thing on the planet. But the number of these pieces and rules that we fully understand is still small, and our ability to understand how all the events play out is still limited. 
Thankfully, in the 21st century, we have tools, incredible tools, to help us understand the complex events of the natural world. Computers. Steve Jobs called computers a bicycle for the mind when he talked about how they let us make exceptional leaps of understanding. This has led to huge progress for the world and continues to transform our lives and our society in a global revolution of efficiency. What if we could better harness the use of computers to unlock the ancient mysteries of life and to begin to understand this alien technology? What if we could understand all life by playing with virtual replicas inside computers the same way we play with Lego blocks? This is the idea behind a new revolution called digital biology. Now, the way a computer plays chess is to consider hundreds of thousands, uh, even millions of different possible moves very quickly. Digital biology uses powerful simulation software to reproduce the basic functions of life, all those events that happen as a result of those pieces of life moving about. So that means that a computer program, inside of it, we can see and modify hundreds of thousands, even millions of the events as they happen in virtual replicas of DNA, of cells, of tissues, of organs, and whole organisms, just as they do in the real thing. Within the computer, we can watch as the DNA uncoils, and we can watch the molecule move around, and we can see all the clockwork play out. Learning how this works in simple cells is the first step to understanding what happens inside the cells of your brain when you fall in love. But in order to figure out how that works, we have to start somewhere small. As a start, researchers at Stanford have recently built a computer model of a simple microbe that accounts for all of its known molecular events. When they test how closely it matches examples of the real living microbe doing things real living microbes do, they find the best match with real data ever reported by a complex computer model. There's still a lot more to be done, but this new approach to reproducing biological events inside of computers gives us the chance to understand malfunctions of human life, such as disease and aging, helps us to better unlock the secrets of clean biological energy production, or a host of technologies not even yet dreamed of. What if the production of this incredible new technology was not just done behind the closed doors of academia, but could be done in the public eye using open science, a new approach to organizing scientific investigation on the internet? After I left graduate school, I was able to co-found and help to organize a project that's been pushing on the boundaries of digital biology and open science that we call OpenWorm. OpenWorm is dedicated to creating the first digital organism in a computer in a completely open science manner. And specifically, we're using C. elegans, a microscopic worm, <laughs> as our focus of investigation. He's about as long as a hair on your head is wide, and he has only about 1,000 cells in his whole body. It's been the focus of research for three Nobel Prize winners because it carries incredible insight into all life, including that of humans. Hundreds of contributors from countries around the world have been helping us to build a detailed computer model of this, and it's one of the best understood animals in all of biology. So let me give you an example of kind of how this works. This is Pedro Tabacoff. He lives in Brazil, and he's a student of engineering. A year ago, he came across the OpenWorm project and logged on to the project's online rallying point on GitHub. Uh, if you're not familiar with GitHub, it's kind of like a nerdy version of Facebook, but for computer programmers. Okay, cool. He reached out to us via email, and we talked to him via a Google Hangout. Across four time zones and thousands of miles, never having met in person before, we found a small slice of the project that he felt comfortable taking on. Two weeks later, he submitted to the project code that solved a problem that the whole community was able to see. Four months later, he was a co-author on a publication at a scientific conference in Stockholm. Open Science is a bridge that brought Pedro's efforts over a few weekends from Sao Paulo to a global scientific community. This is Andrei Palyanov and Sergei Hyrulin. They live in Novosibirsk, Siberia, and work in a research institute as scientists. Three years ago, when OpenWorm was just getting off the ground, they had just uploaded to YouTube a video of their latest design 
for a computer simulation of a worm. At the same time, a single tweet had caused a small group to coalesce around the similar idea to build a computer simulated worm. And excitedly, Andre and Sergey received an email from this group excited about their video and asking if they could help and if they would join a project called OpenWorm. Three years later, their work combined with that of many others has been featured in many scientific publications and conferences, has been in BBC News and the science section of The Economist, and has helped successfully crowdfund a Kickstarter campaign. Open science is the bridge that enabled a few passionate thinkers with similar ideas to find each other in ways that would have been highly unlikely before the internet. And for such a problem, this is really needed because we need as many people from as many different backgrounds as possible to be able to find each other to work on it. These individuals and many more like them are donating their time and effort to build computer models in order to feed their own curiosity about this ancient mystery of how life works. And they're taking advantage of modern innovations in computing power and communications to do it. While they're starting with a tiny creature that may seem unimportant, and let's face it, maybe a little gross, they understand that the same alien technology that makes it work, the same moves and rules and events that happen inside the cells of the worm are the same kinds of events that happen in all of life across the planet. They understand that what separates this worm from you or I is not so much that they have completely different chess pieces and completely different chess moves, but in fact they're the same. They're just playing out on a different board and with different combinations. Their generosity towards volunteering their effort in this common endeavor powers an international open science community that continues to grow. So as I have gone from engineering to neuroscience to open science, the biggest misunderstanding that I hear that most people have about the natural world is this. People commonly tend to believe that boiling down what happens in our bodies to chemistry makes us less special. But I think exactly the opposite is true. I think that this extra understanding only adds to the incredible beauty of the world. As part of this planet, you are part of a symphony of events that are happening inside of you and all around you. Don't miss it. The mystic of the past would have called this effect or would have explained this effect as being part of a global energy put here by divine forces. And, and that's not a bad metaphor, but in the 21st century, we have the opportunity per to pursue a much deeper and more specific understanding of this mysterious, ancient, alien technology that's driving the incredible microscopic events of the natural world. We now have the opportunity to explore together this brave new space and together as one interconnected global community, we can come together unified by our curiosity, our generosity, and our passion to unlock the secrets of disease, the promise of clean energy, and maybe someday the deep and beautiful mystery of love. Thank you.